I'm going to invite Pastor Bob to come up here. He's going to, act, he's going to actually use Bob. This pulpit hasn't been used since the first day I was here. Because, because most people, in order to see me, there's a step stool up here, and you've got to stand on it just so people can see me. So you're a taller guy than me. So you probably, you probably don't need that thing. But I'm going to invite Pastor Bob to come up. He's from our Dreersville East Sea Church, and he's going to share the word with us this morning. I did tell everyone that you are retiring this year, and this is part of your farewell tour. You know, making the rounds. Yeah. I'm not used to using a mic where I'm at our church. You put two of them inside of this, so bear with me. What an awesome day it is to come here today to, to really worship in God. Uh, he has given us a great day, hasn't he? And as I heard the, the choir's uh, uh, hymn this morning, it's what an awesome message for us to learn there. To, do not fear that God is with us all the time. and That he is, and what a blessing it is. So I'm just honored to be here this morning. I want to thank uh, Reverend Tim, Ted and all of you for having me this morning. Uh, it's Many years I've been driving past this church, and never did I ever dream I'd be standing up here to preach in it, but thank you all once again. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Galatians. It's from chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, or 1 through 10, and is found on page 889 of your Pew Bible, for those of you who'd like to follow along. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks... He is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to someone else, for each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in this world must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. It is the word of our Lord, and we do ask his blessing upon it. Amen. Let us pray. O eternal God, You who lived before time began and who will be the great I am when when time is no more. I pray that you will bless the seeds I sow today that they may bear fruit to you and bless all those whom we love. I pray this in Jesus' name who died and was buried so that true life may spring forth. In Christ's name. Amen. How many of you still have or possibly had a place where you could go, secret place where you could go at some time just to be alone? Well, there's a story about a little boy who had a place like that. On the back of their property, uh, there was an old fruit tree. Now, the tree would get lots of leaves on it, but it would never bear any fruit. 
High up in the branches hidden by the leaves was this little boy's secret spot where he could go and just be alone. It was a spot where he would go when he felt mistreated or, or misunderstood or when he just wanted to be alone like a lot of other little boys like to do sometimes. But that tree was his hideaway. It was a special place for him and to another little boy who was his friend. So you can imagine how he must have felt one day when his father said, that old fruit tree in the back of our lot there, I'm going to cut down. It hasn't bear, bore any fruit for so many years, and I'm going to get rid of it. Now, what could the little boy do? If he begged his father not to cut it down, then it would have, he'd have to tell him why, and it would no longer be his secret hide of hideaway anymore. So he came up with this wonderful idea. And since there were a lot of apple trees close by, he and his little friend, they went and they collected a whole basketful of these red, delicious apples. Well, that evening, they climbed up into the tree and they tied the apples by their stem onto every branch that he could find. Well, the next morning when his father went out, and he looked at the old tree, he was amazed to see that all the fruit had grown on this tree. So he comes back inside, and uh, he, with a wink, a twinkle in his eye, he said, you're not going to believe this, he told his wife. But a miracle had taken place last night. He said, that old fruit tree in the back of our lot, it's filled with fat, juicy apples. His wife looked at him, she, and she smiled, and she said, that is amazing. And the father answered, yes, he said, it's a double miracle, he said. He said, because that old tree isn't an apple tree, it's a pear tree. <laughs> so, so we chuckle at this because we all know that apple trees don't produce pear trees, and that pear trees don't produce apples. When you sow pear seeds, you expect to get a pear tree. When you sow apple seed, you expect to get an apple tree. Because we learned long time ago that what you sow is what you reap. And that's so true in our lives. Now, do these words sound familiar to Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 6, verses, one, uh, through, uh, verses 7 through 9? It's when Paul said, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sow, he said. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap the harvest if we do not give up. You see, that principle that Paul shares with us here has been around for a long, long time. In fact, Jesus taught that same principle back in Matthew chapter 13 when he spoke about the parable of the farmer who went out to sow good seed in his field. Now, I'm sure he's heard that story before. He planted the seed in the daytime, but at nighttime when he slept, an enemy came and he planted bad seed or weeds. Now, no one uh, knew about it until one day a servant discovered that there were weeds growing alongside the wheat. So he rushes in and he tells his master, we have weeds growing around among our wheat. Well, they thought about that for a moment, and they finally come up with the conclusion that someone had to go out there and plant weeds within our weed seed within our weeds. Hosea the prophet also said, "If you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind." And either further back in that, in in the book of Exodus, Moses said, "An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth." 
a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a wound for a wound. Moses is talking about reaping what we sow. And yet further back than that, in Genesis 1, chapter 11, where God forms the earth, and he said, let the ground bring forth grass and the herbs yielding seed. And every fruit-bearing tree bring forth fruit after its own kind. And it was so. So you see, the principle of sowing and reaping is as old as life itself. When, when you sow, what you sow in life is what you reap. Well, in our lesson this morning, Paul begins his statement of this eternal principle with, I believe it's with some very disturbing words, though. He said, do not be deceived because God cannot be mocked. Hmm, I thought about that for a moment and tried to figure out what did Paul say? Why did he say that? Is it possible for, for us to be deceived? Well, I know there's many people uh, think that they can pull the wool over God's eyes by thinking that he doesn't see what they're doing or know what they're doing. That he doesn't know what's in their side, their hearts and their minds. Many people think that. But here Paul tells us, you must not deceive yourself. You're not deceiving God. God knows what kind of seed you're sowing and whatever kind of seed you're sowing, that is a seed that you will reap when a day of harvest comes, it tells us. Paul's telling us. So with that in mind, there are four important lessons in this passage that I would like to just mention here this morning for us. And the first one is this. A wise person he sows with the, heart, with the harvest in mind. I've grown up on farmlands all of my life. And I know if you ask a farmer why he's planting so many seeds, he's going to tell you in hopes of getting a lot more seed, a lot more uh, crop. Believe me, a farmer just doesn't plant seed just for the fun of it. But yet I know if you ask a farmer why he's farming, he'll tell you because he enjoys doing it. But you know, in relationship to our own lives, I feel that many enjoy sowing without ever giving a thought about the harvest that will come. They sow for the joy of it. And let me give you an example here. How many remember Ann Landers? She used to write a column in the uh, Pottsville Republic, and uh, I believe every day she'd write one. You ever follow her writings? Well, a few years ago, she published a letter that a letter from a prison inmate that kind of stuck with me, really. It was a pathetic letter that really tugged at your emotions. You see, a man who was in prison and couldn't attend his mother's funeral, he wrote this letter to her. Now, he didn't write the letter to complain about the legal system because he, he already admitted that he deserved to get what he's getting there. But what he did, he wrote the story about his life, of how his mother's one wish was that he would be released from prison before she passed away, and how that one wish was never realized. He said, the reason I'm in prison is because I thought that I could take shortcuts in life, and somehow I could ignore the rules and still get away with it. But I didn't, and you really never do. That's a good example of someone who sold without thinking of the harvest in mind. But then again, think about the Apostle Paul. It would have seemed to be smarter for Paul to just remain a Jew. After all, he had prestige and honor among them. He was a, an ex, a very respected teacher and leader of the Jewish circles. 
But when Paul became a Christian, that's when his suffering began. He was beaten, he was imprisoned, and finally he was killed because he believed in Jesus Christ. But you see, Paul, contrary to that inmate, Paul was sowing with his mind in the harvest. And you see, that made all the difference for him. So remember, the first lesson I want you to remember is a wise person sows with a harvest in mind. And the second lesson is brief, but also very important, I believe. You reap what you sow. Do you ever hear that, that statement during your life? You reap what you sow. If you sow wild oats, you're not going to get corn. You're going to get wild oats. Right now, I pray that I'm hopefully planting some good seeds and that you are as well. Because now is a time of planning for all of us. But we need to also remember that there are also two harvest times. There's the present time. Some of the seed we have sown in the past is now being harvested in our lives. Believe me, I'm starting to harvest some of the seed that I sowed years ago. An aching back and a knees that snap, crackle, and pop. So you know what I mean there. We go through many experiences in life. And now we begin, a lot of us, to reap what we sow. But there's also the future harvest for us. The seed that we sow now will be the determining factor in where we spend eternity. And at harvest, people, we will reap forever and ever. So remember, there are two harvest times, the present time and the future. So I want you to remember you will reap what you sow for all eternity. The third lesson is this uh, passage of scripture that I'd like to uh, learn, I want you to learn is, you always harvest more than what you sow. If you ask the farmer how much seed corn he's going to plant, he's probably going to tell you 15 to 20 bushel. And if you ask him how much uh, corn he expects to uh, harvest, he's not going to tell you 15 to 20 bushel. Because if he does, you know that he has a little problem there. Because we all know that you don't look just to harvest what you plant. But you and I know also he won't tell you that. He'll probably tell you, I expect to harvest a wagon full of corn, a lot more than what I sowed. So you see, the great principle of sowing and reaping not only tells us that we will reap what we sow, but also that we will reap more than what we sow. And this is true no matter what we're planning in life. As I said, there are a lot of people out there today who think that they are pulling the wool over God's eyes. But also that they also know that it's not going to be so. And today they're starting to reap what they sowed. And they're starting to cry out, I didn't do anything to deserve, to deserve this. It's worse than anybody can ever imagine. Why me? But just maybe, maybe they have experimented a little bit too long with alcoholism or smoking or drugs. And now they're actually reaping that harvest. Then again, I guess I could say I'm glad that the principle really works two ways here. Because there have been many times I said, Lord, why did I ever deserve to have a wonderful wife and two great kids and one who made me a grandpa and given me such a 
wonderful and awesome grandson. I really didn't deserve any of this. So you see, it works both ways. People, one day, we're all going to leave this world. And, and the Bible says that some will spend eternity in Hades, where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And they're going to be crying out, we didn't do anything to deserve this. And there's going to be some that spend eternity in heaven, where the streets are lined with gold and they stand before the throne of God, surrounded by angels, praising God day and night. And you know, they too will be saying, we didn't do anything to deserve this. But you see, whether it's for the good or for the bad, not only will we reap what we sow, but we will reap also much more than what we sowed. And the last lesson I want you to learn is this. Even innocent people will reap the seed that we sow. Adam and Eve introduced sin into the world back in the Garden of Eden. And every time you and I stand by the graveside of our loved ones, we are reaping the harvest that they sowed back then. Every time we deal with weaknesses and sickness and disease, we are reaping the harvest that they sowed back in the Garden of Eden. We had nothing to do with the planting of that seed. But today we're still reaping that harvest. And it's true in our homes, isn't it? If we're going to sow seeds of dishonesty and greed and hatred in our children's lives, they aren't going to stay, they're not sowing the seeds, but they're going to reap the harvest. If we're sowing the seeds of love and compassion and, and joy and peace in our hearts, they too receive that harvest, even though they didn't plant it. Just look at the harvest. That, just look at what we are harvesting today by someone who planted a seed many years ago when we took God out of our schools. Paul said, do not be deceived. Yeah, I wonder how many are being deceived. How many are thinking that they're pulling the wool over God's eyes and that they're getting away with something? I can't help to think that how many of us think only about the fun of sowing and never about the harvest in mind. How many of us think that we can actually live according to the world and still inherit heaven? Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. So in closing, here is the greatest lesson to learn, I believe, from these scriptures. If you're not very proud of the seed that you sown years ago, or even today yet, the good news is Jesus Christ came to die for your sins and for my sins and to cleanse us from, cleanse us with his own precious blood. And when you accept him as your Lord and Savior and you're obedient to him in Christian baptism, then you are promised that your bad seeds, all your sins, will be forgiven. They'll be gone forever. That's the greatest lesson, I believe, of all to learn here. And that's the Lord's invitation to all of us. And I pray that each one of us will respond to that. Amen. Let us pray.
Oh, Heavenly Father, when we reflect on how you have supported and cared for us in the past, we cannot fail to give you thanks, O Lord. When we consider the way you give us courage and, and help for each new day, oh Lord, we are filled with a sense of gratitude and praise in our lives. When you lift us up from the pit of doubt and despair, our whole life feels renewed and refreshed. Thank you, Father. Oh, what a comfort it is, Lord, to know the love and support you bring to us through your Son and by your Spirit. Oh, Father, we ask that you let us not forget those this morning that know little else but sadness in their lives. In our sense of gratitude and praise, O oh Lord, let us not forget those who planted and never thought about the harvest, and now their lives are filled with regrets and broken hearts. In our feelings of support and guidance, O oh Lord, let us not forget those who are harvesting seed they didn't plant and are now struggling with life's difficulties and disappointments, alone and uncared for. In our desire to give you praise, we pray for the suffering of this life. We remember all of our loved ones in nursing homes, all of our shut-ins, the homeless in our community and in our inner cities, all oh, those who hunger and thirst, those in hospitals and those who are filled with worries and fears, the lonely and those who are grieving today. Oh, Father, you are not only the God of this world, you are the ruler of your heavenly kingdom. Strengthen us, we pray, while we live out our life on this earth, showing people your compassion and your love. Show us the reality of your kingdom where there is no more suffering, no more pain or regret, so that we may also share that with those who are without hope here in this world. For Lord, we just ask and we pray all these things in the name of your precious name, Jesus Christ.